Well, we've looked at several passages at Matthew over the last 18 months or so. And I was looking at chapter 16 the other day, and I thought we would look at it tonight because it is a turning point in the ministry of Jesus. It's actually the moment when we see Jesus transition from speaking to the huge crowds to actually taking his disciples away and teaching them in a more private, more intimate way. And in the verse just before our passage tonight, verse 16, Peter makes the single most confession of faith, the most important confession of faith in Jesus that we've seen so far. Verse 15, Jesus asked Peter, so who do you, Peter, say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Peter's confession, uh, confession is factual, it's profound, and it is necessary. And Jesus says that He's figured that out not on his own, but that it was actually revelation from God that he understood that. And it is, in fact, the cardinal creed of the church. Jesus is the Christ. He is God's own son. He's the Messiah. He is God incarnate. He is truly man and he is truly God in essence and substance. And each one of those statements is important. But still, it's not quite everything one needs to know about Jesus because it doesn't tell us anything about the reason for his presence or his purpose in being here. And if you think about it, if you were to tell someone who Jesus was, you might say, as Peter did, Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. But you would innately know that that doesn't explain everything. So you might add that he only came to earth to suffer and die on a cross for the sins of the world so that you and I might be saved to eternal life. And what follows in our passage here this evening is a logical progression of teaching from Jesus. Peter has confirmed that he and the disciples have understood who Jesus is. So now Jesus will take that. He's going to build on it. Because they need to know why he came, the purpose of his coming, and what it actually means to follow Jesus. You see, when he leaves them in what is going to be a very short period of time, they're going to be responsible for taking this message not only to the world, but to all the generations that have followed since. So they need to understand the whole and the complete message. So before I read this, let me, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we come to this portion of First Wednesday tonight where we we have this passage open in front of us. And we ask that by your spirit that you would be here to open our hearts and minds and help us to understand and deal with with the thoughts and the things that you want to teach us here. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 16, starting at verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. So far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his father. And then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the son of man coming in his kingdom. Amen. Well, Jesus begins his teaching there in verse 21 by concentrating on two points. One point is filled with hate. One point is filled with hope. Firstly, he says that the rulers in Jerusalem will conspire against him and kill him. But that would not be the end because he would rise again. 
And verse 21 is, it's not totally new information, but it is the first time that Jesus has been so specific. His teaching now had an emphasis and it was explicit in his context. For example, this is the first time that he lays out the chronology of his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. And he also says that it is the Sanhedrin who will officially execute him. And as he begins to show them these things, it's evident that Jesus's interpretation of Messiahship includes suffering and death. And as we've noted on several occasions, this was a concept that was just not acceptable to the Jews. You see, they, their Messiah was to come and be a liberator of the nation. And Peter's response in verse 22 is evidence of the profound misunderstanding of what the Messiah would be and do. A suffering Messiah was against everything that they were hoping for. And whereas Jesus said that Peter's confession was from God, Peter's challenge to Jesus as he taught of the work and purpose of the Messiah came from Peter himself. Kind of one of those stupid things that just comes out of the darkened mind of human beings. And in his confusion, Peter found himself as a mouthpiece for Satan, as Satan used him to, uh, to argue against Jesus fulfilling his purpose and his calling. But the logic of the conversation continues. Firstly, Peter has confirmed for us that Jesus is the Messiah. Secondly, he tells us what he must do as Messiah. He must suffer, die, and rise again. And now Jesus teaches what it means for those who believe in him and would become followers of his. And the connection between verses 24 and 25 is clear. If following Jesus means identification with him, then the Lord's disciples must be prepared to share the faith that he has just prophesied for himself in verse 21. Verse 24, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, this statement was actually first seen back in chapter 10, and the repetition of this statement here is, I think, an indication of how vital Jesus thought this teaching to be. The other day I was trying to make a transaction on the internet and a message came onto my screen. We have updated and changed our terms and conditions. Please tick the box to show your acceptance. Now, usually I just tick the box like everybody else and go on. But on that day I had an urge to sort of look at them. And I can confirm to you that the amount of pages were uncountable, much less readable. So, I simply went ahead and ticked the box and I accepted them and a little note came up and said, thank you for your acceptance. And I thought at the time, this is a good illustration of what we see here. Jesus having explained what it means for him to be the Messiah, now goes on to explain what it means for those who follow him. And he states, if you will, the terms and conditions for the followers of Jesus. The difference, however, is that Jesus' terms and conditions are short. They're to the point. They've never been changed or updated since their inception. And essentially what he is saying is that the pathway that he would walk is the pathway that his followers must be prepared to walk. It's the pathway of the crucified Christ. It's the pathway that goes down the road of suffering and rejection and death. And it's the pathway to his vindication and resurrection, which is a pathway of humiliation. But it's also the pathway that eventually ends in glory and a crown. And as we follow the passage this evening, I think we'll see that what Jesus says in these statements is clear. And they actually challenge any notion of discipleship as simply a few minor adjustments to our lifestyle. In other words, they challenge many of the contemporary views of what it actually means to follow Jesus. Now, I personally am of the belief that many people have looked at the salvation story and they've turned their backs on it. 
Not because they have examined it and found it to be untrue, but because they have met many Christians. And they have found that they found it to appear unimportant. Unimportant because in the lives of many Christians, it just seems to be so absolutely ineffective, even useless. You see, many Christians believe that they are to carry on exactly as they were, add a little Jesus to the total sum of their life, and voila, they're in the Christian life. And people around them see that and they say, well, what the heck is this Christian life of yours anyway? It doesn't seem to have changed your marriage. It doesn't seem to have changed your attitude at work or your business practices. It doesn't seem to have changed anything about you at all, as a matter of fact. But Jesus is saying that for his true followers, no change is impossible. He's saying that our minds, our morals, our resources, every thought, every word and action are to be brought under the scrutiny of verse 24. And when that happens, change must come. If anyone would come after me, he said, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I mean, there you have it. The T's and C's for following Jesus are essentially two points. And they've never been modified, changed, or updated. But before we look at them, I think it will be helpful, if not necessary, to have a, a short review of some of the things that we've talked about at First Wednesday over the last 10 or 11 years so that none of us misunderstand the application of these verses. Firstly, I want to underline that our salvation comes from trusting in Jesus. And our trust in Jesus is a response to his initiative and his grace in your life and mine. And it's that same grace, his grace, that brings us to faith in him, which also sustains us and makes it possible for us to follow him. Therefore, the distinguishing feature of a Christian is that a life that believes in Jesus is a life that follows Jesus. And the only source of strength to both believe and to follow is found in the grace of God alone. I mean, there are some Christians who have the idea that what it means to be a Christian is to say a prayer or walk the aisle or join a church or be born into a church family. And then after that event takes place, they then believe you just go home and hang on for dear life as you try your hardest to live a godly life. Well, I can assure you that will not work. So as we look at these verses, remember that you were saved by the grace of God to the faith that he gave you. And the same God who saved you by his grace will now also provide you with whatever you need to follow Christ. And what Jesus is doing in these verses is laying out exactly what discipleship means. And these verses say to us, if discipleship means identification with the master, then the Lord's disciples must be prepared to walk the same pathway that he has just prophesied for himself. So the first point in our T's and C's are that a follower must deny himself or deny herself. In other words, my life is no longer all about me. It's no longer about my identity or all about my agenda. And for all of us every day, we are all about ourselves and our agendas. An earlier theologian said, the problem for all of us is that in a thousand ways every day, we make ourselves the center of the universe. We make life all about me. And that is how it is until by the grace of God, we begin to see that life is actually all about him. Life is all about Jesus. And the kind of transformation that involves is so radical it can only be brought about by the infusion of a power from outside of ourselves. But it's that kind of radical change that produces tangible evidence in a person's life. Evidence that witnesses to the fact that by the grace of God, this person has been united with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And that union produces fruit. Love and grace begin to reveal themselves. So much so that our friends and neighbors may be challenged by them. They may be frustrated or threatened by them. They might be annoyed by them. They might even be enamored by them. But nonetheless, they are able to see them. You see, what is being described here by Jesus is the denunciation of self-idolatry. And this is something to be struggled with for all of us. You remember the song by Billy Joel, My Life, I don't care what you say anymore, this is my life. Get on with your own life and leave me alone. Pardon the singing. Now that was a big hit. And I think it was a big hit because it spoke straight into the generation. Taken to its logical conclusion, it allows people to divorce without guilt. It allows children to abuse their parents. It allows people to cheat, steal. It allows spouses to run away with other spouses. It allows everyone to do whatever they want to do. You're not going to tell me what to do. This is my life. You've got your own life. Go live it. And that is man as man is. And that is woman as woman is. You don't have to learn that. Nobody has to teach you that. You don't have to go to school to have it explained to you. You never have to go out and buy a book to learn how to do that. I mean, imagine going to the bookstore looking for a book entitled something like How to Be Unbelievably Selfish with Your Spouse or Eight Ways to Abuse Your Mother and Father. Now, I mean, we, we laugh at those things, but actually there are books like that. They're just a bit more subtle in their description. You find them under, under titles like Take Charge of Your Life or Eight Ways to Personal Success or How to Make It to the Top. I mean, that's why these words of Jesus, to deny yourself, are so radical and they are radical in every generation and in almost every situation I can think of. And as he goes on to the second point, he sort of turns the heat up a little. Jesus says his followers must also take up their cross. Now, I'm sure you've heard people say, we all have our crosses to bear. For example, at Lent, you might hear somebody say, well, I'm not eating chocolate for this Lent. That's going to be my cross to bear. You know, that is so pure. It's beyond the comprehension. That is not at all what Jesus is saying. Jesus is using an extreme metaphor from the Roman world, and it would have struck home with all his listeners. As we know, the Romans had conceived the most brutal, horrible form of death ever known to humanity, and those hearing Jesus speak, they would know firsthand the scene where some poor soul, having been sentenced to death, would be seen walking across the horizon to the place of his execution, dragging his cross along with him. And by using this image, Jesus is putting a vivid, striking, even shocking picture in the minds of his listeners. And as he uses it in his teaching on discipleship, well, he can only be trying to underline the seriousness of the subject. So you see, the terms and conditions here are very clear. Deny yourself and take up your cross. And if you can't tick the box and sign for your acceptance of the T's and C's, well, then you can't follow Jesus. You might think you are, but Jesus doesn't think you are. And the implication of the terms and conditions are equally straightforward. He goes on to explain the implications of what it means to accept the terms and conditions. Starting at verse 25, we see that firstly, there is the change in the way a believer views life. Instead of doing everything we can to preserve life, the disciple of Jesus, with eternity in view, is ready to lose it. And whoever wants to save his life, protect it, hold on to it, in other words, live for himself or herself, will actually lose it in the end. And this is a paradox which says that the Christian life means absolute allegiance to the person of Jesus and absolute adherence 
to the gospel of Jesus. At verse 27, Jesus uses the prospect of the judgment to motivate his followers to a life of sacrificial service. And then we look at verse 28, and you can imagine that this has been the subject of great debate. And there are a number of possibilities, many of which have been supported and thought of by intelligent, great, godly men. I'm not going to go into them all, but i just say that I feel most comfortable with you that Jesus is referring to the transfiguration, which comes at the start of chapter 17. It's not really the point which view you take, but on the hill of transfiguration, Peter, James, and John saw what had been hidden from view that Jesus of Nazareth was no less than the eternal King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And in that context, that statement in verse 28 reinforces the previous one. And this is the point though to the whole section here, that the Lord Jesus will be the judge of all the earth and he's going to come again in judgment. So I think we should take note that in these verses, Jesus has made some magnificent claims to Messiahship. He has spoken of God the Father as his Father. He has spoken of the Father's glory as his own glory. He has spoken of the angels of God as his servants and of himself as the judge of all men and of the kingdom of God as his kingdom. I mean, no less than the Messiah, the Christ of God, can do justice to those claims. And his message is clear, that he must suffer and die. And that his followers must be ready to suffer as well. You see, if his followers are to do his work, then they must do it his way. And there is a judgment coming, and it will take into account precisely and in what measure a person demonstrated his or her loyalty to Christ by sharing in his sufferings. And when Jesus says we must pick up our cross and follow him, we should note that there is, there's only one cross that Jesus, the Prince of Glory, died on it. And none of us will die for sin or even die for our own sin or most certainly the salvation of others. Only Jesus could do that. But still, there are many ways to carry our cross for Christ in this life. In fact, he showed us many, many, many ways that he carried his cross through life. I mean, firstly, for example, he suffered as a poor man who had, had no time to devote to his own comfort. Back in Matthew 8, you may remember famously, he said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. He was, in modern terminology, homeless. And that's a hard place to be. And from the very start of his life, that was the case. Born in a stable, laid in a manger. He never went out begging, although in fact, he did live off the generosity of others. But as he lived off the generosity of the others, at the same time, he knew he had the right and the title deeds to everyone's riches. And still he claimed nothing for himself. Secondly, he obviously faced terrible suffering at the end of his life. Obviously, the physical suffering inflicted upon him by evil men, but think about the excruciating spiritual suffering when the cup of divine wrath against sin was poured into his heart. And to make it even worse, he knew it was coming. He had to endure the anticipation of it. And with a mind as powerful and an imagination as vivid and sensitive as his, you know, I do wonder if the racking pain at the end of his life was ever brought forward in his thoughts to be suffered again and again and again, long before it actually happened. I mean, the moments in the garden are, are proof of that. There we witness the pain of anticipation, the knowledge of what was to come, overwhelming his soul to the point that his body poured out sweat like great drops of blood. He also suffered the sorrow of a man who, who loved righteousness more than any man has ever loved it. And yet he was accused of being a liar and a heretic and a traitor. That must have hurt him deeply. He was also the one who loved the Sabbath day 
as no one has ever loved it before or since. But he was accused of treating the Lord's Day, his Father's Day, with contempt. The religious leaders even said that he was in league with Satan. And think of it, after all they had seen and heard, the people who had been following around his countrymen finally preferred a thief, Barabbas, to him. That's how low he had sunk in their estimation. When he was being scourged and then crucified and hung on the cross, they mocked him. They laughed at him for his apparent weakness, and yet he never did anything. He said nothing because he knew our salvation depended on him. He also had to bear the cross of being deserted by his friends. I'm sure it was terrible enough to have the entire nation think of him as a bad man, but to have the few men who knew him best desert him at the end and run for their lives, they left him to be alone as the full weight of, of God and man was brought down to bear on him. And then there was also the cross of painful and tiring labor as he resisted temptation all his life. And like you and me, he resisted every temptation to the bitter end. You know, I find that I, I do learn from times when I actually am able to overcome a powerful temptation. You may learn from that as well, but the one thing I have learned is how much effort it takes out of me. And Jesus was doing that every day. And then think of Peter. Jesus was facing the horror of his future. He was just beginning to share some of the detail with his closest friends, his, his band of 12. And suddenly his closest friend and supporter starts telling him he shouldn't do it. Even his friends tempted him to, to put down his cross and to leave the way that had been appointed to him. I mean, this is only a superficial survey of some of the crosses that Jesus showed us by his example before he was hung on the cross. But still, this survey of his sufferings on our behalf, well, it makes it perfectly obvious how and why those who follow him and serve him must be ready to bear their own crosses in following him. I mean, our cross may be the loss of an excess of this world's pleasures and comforts because we have decided ourselves that we're going to devote ourselves to him instead. It may be the scorn of the world that falls upon men and women who will not walk as the world does, who refuse to worship the gods of the world. You see, a faithful Christian's life is a reproach. It's a criticism to unbelief. And that reproach is very often not forgiven. The more faithful a Christian life, the more certainly it will be patronized and belittled by the world. And think about the bitter fight that must be waged in the heart, hour after hour, day after day, to resist temptation and remain pure and holy before God and man. Or it might be like Jesus, that we just must simply work ourselves without rest in order to tend to all those needs that have to be done by us in our service to God. And we could go on and on. But you see the point. There is an immediate connection between the Lord's suffering and that of his disciples, between his cross and ours. And this is the key. All of the sorrows that Jesus bore were for the kingdom of God. And that should be our driving force as well the kingdom of God. I mean, there's no doubt that our crosses and our sorrows are much lighter and far less significant than his. But ours must be of the same type. They must originate in the same place. They must come from the same source. And that is looking forward to the kingdom of God. It's important to note that Jesus is not talking here about the sorrows and the difficulties that we bring upon ourselves as a result of our own sins and our own folly. No, he is speaking of the crosses that we bear for him and for his kingdom. And Jesus makes all this very clear, but notice too that he also turns to help us. He knows our frailty. 
He knows the, how easy it is for us to resent and then lay down our cross. I mean, he was tempted to resent and lay down his every hour of every day. So he offers us help and encouragement to stick to our task. He explains that the man or the woman who finds their comfort in this life, that exchanges Christ's cross for a life of ease and pleasure, self-idolatry, will rue that choice at some point for the rest of eternity. But the man or the woman who takes up Christ's cross, they will live forever in the heavenly country. And, and here is the bottom line. Jesus says there will be a day of judgment. And there and there only will the true meaning of all the choices that we've made in this world be revealed. Eternity, heaven, hell are all realities of the life to come. And they loom over every sorrow endured for Jesus' sake in this world. And they call to us through the trials and the tribulations of a godly life in a sinful world. They promise us everlasting joy in exchange for temporary troubles. I don't think we should ever lose sight of these things. It's no wonder that Matthew over and over again casts our vision forward to the end of the age, to the day of judgment and the consummation of every human life in the world to come, either in woe or in eternal well-being. I mean, these things explains why a Christian man or woman want to follow Christ. In verse 26, Jesus asks a question that cuts right to the heart of the issue. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but loses his soul? And how does one know that he or she has not or will not lose their soul? Well, Jesus says here that it's by showing themselves willing to deny themselves and to take up their cross for his sake. Being prepared to suffer in the same way the Savior did for the same reasons he suffered and to await in faith for the reckoning of the last day. Knowing that the Son of Man will reward each person according to what he or she has done. And I think whether we like it or not or we admit it or not, every human being in this world is in the process of making an exchange of his present life for some situation in the world to come. Jesus says a man or a woman can save their life now and lose it then, or sacrifice it now and save it then. You know, I think every one of us should consider these things as if we're hearing them for the first time. Jesus said and repeated such things on a number of occasions. His repetition should show us how vital it is that we receive, believe, and, and live accordingly. Firstly, lay before the Lord your self-denial and take up the cross for his sake. And then share with Jesus in the eternal joy set before him. For great, he says, is your reward in heaven. That's the ultimate meaning of life. And as we sit here tonight, we are all making an exchange. There is, on the one hand, the temporal joys of the world, while on the other hand, there is a life of humility and service to the kingdom in the name of Jesus. We spoke about Richard Buse earlier, and I just wanted to say that he was a, a great preacher of the gospel, and he was a man who over the last few years became a mentor and a teacher uh, a fantastic encourager and a friend to me. And since he died, I thank God on several occasions for actually putting Richard into my life. Richard was for me an example of what walking the Christian life actually meant. Rico Tice, who many of you know, he was a very, very close friend of Richard's. And he shared a personal moment about Richard when he spoke at his funeral. It was a cameo of the man that I can attest it is as he truly was. We go tell the story about an event in Holland in the year 2000. 10,000 evangelists and missionaries were there from all over the world, 92 countries, he said. 
Billy Graham was supposed to give the closing address, the final send-off at the conference. It was to last about 12 to 14 minutes. But a few weeks before the conference, Dr. Graham found that he was going to be too ill to be able to travel, so he phoned his friend Richard and asked him if he would stand in for him. Richard, of course, said yes, and he immediately began making notes for his sermon. He involved his preaching team at All Souls to get ideas and feedback. He edited his words down to the final full stop. He crafted his body movements and how he was, where he was going to look and how he was going to move. And he practiced it and he memorized it and he rehearsed it in front of a full length mirror. And he rehearsed it also for family and friends. And then finally the day came. And before the sermon, there was a music group who were supposed to do a couple of hymns for about eight minutes. However, they took well over 20, and Richard's sermon was scratched. There were buses waiting outside, planes and trains to catch, and 10,000 people trying to leave at once. There was no, there was no flexibility in the time. And after it had Rico left his seat, went behind the stage looking for Richard, he found Richard sipping a cup of tea. And he ran up with great sympathy in his voice and he said, Oh, Richard, they cut your talk. And he said, Oh, no, 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 Rico, you don't understand. We're just servants. We're only here to do as they ask. We're just servants. And you know, I think, I'm afraid that if that had been me, I would have gone on with some very highfalutin words. I might have said something like, you can't send 10,000 missionaries back home without somebody proclaiming the word of God. I mean, how can you send that many people off without, without some proclamation of the word? What were those people thinking about? But all the time in my heart, what I'd really be thinking was, they cut my sermon. And the one thing I have learned from Richard Bees, and I have learned many, many, many things from him, but the one thing that still sticks out in my mind today is that no one has ever been humiliated by humility. And no one has ever been humiliated by being generous or loving or encouraging or living in service to others in the name of Jesus for the kingdom of God. This is, after all, the Bible's simplest definition of humility, isn't it? Living to serve others. A life lived to the service of others should be the theme and the prayer of every Christian man and woman. And why? Because we have put our faith and our trust in the supreme example of a life lived for others. I mean, we serve a risen Savior who said of himself, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. He said he came to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to serve and not to be served. And that's why he went to the cross. And it is through his sacrifice, the sacrifice of his life, that men and women today can stand by grace with their sins forgiven, with their eyes looking forward to heaven and with a hope in their hearts, with the knowledge that their sins are forgiven because he bore them in his own body as he hung there on the cross. And that great manifestation of his own glory was motivated by the sure and certain knowledge that it was for our good. To to sacrifice our lives for others in the name of Jesus is how we show that we are truly, truly followers of his. So let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for your word and we acknowledge that it is your word that convicts us that we have fallen short of that which you intend us to be. And so we pray that by your grace and by the work of the Holy Spirit in us, that you would enable us to serve and edify our brothers and sisters in the light of the gospel of the Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray.